Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of this excellent conference on access to justice in environmental matters that has been organised by Client Earth and Justice and Environment. I'm Anya Ryle. I'm co-director of the Centre for Law and the Environment at University College Cork here in Ireland, and it's my great pleasure to be with you today as conference moderator. I'd like to begin by apologising sincerely for my absence yesterday. Um, I was at very short notice called upon to give evidence before the Irish Parliament on the new climate legislation that the Irish government published just last week. So even though I wasn't able to be with you yesterday, I promise you I was in a different capacity uh, pursuing access to justice issues and the importance of public participation. So, so thank you for your patience. And I understand that um, thanks to Client Earth and the wonderful organizers, uh, my, my keynote address is now uh, available online. So th this morning we have a very interesting session on how to promote access rights. And I look forward again as yesterday to seeing people's comments and feel free to use the chat function. And I hope we have a very rich discussion. And I have to say as well that because I serve as vice chair of the Arms Convention Compliance Committee, I'm participating in these conference proceedings in a strictly personal capacity. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first contributor this morning. And this is Luke Laverson, who is a judge in the Belgian court, elected president beginning in September 2020. Uh, Luke is Professor of Environmental Law at Ghent University and of course he's also President of the EU Forum of Judges for the Environment and a member of the Interim Board of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Luke who I've known for very many years and is such a pleasure to work with. So Luke, I look, very for look forward very much to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Aina, for uh, this kind uh, introduction. So when I received uh, the question, what can the judiciary do to uh, improve uh, access to justice in environmental matters, I think two terms came up in my mind. That's training and that's specialization. And those two issues are, uh, I think, intertwined uh, in my uh, opinion. So I think uh, we know all that environmental law is rather complex. It's multi-layered. We have international environmental law. In Europe, we have uh, European environmental law. And we have domestic law. And furthermore, environmental law has some, from time to time, very technical or scientific uh, aspects. So compared with some other branches of law where the judiciary is dealing with, uh, think of some basic uh, criminal law, uh, environmental law looks a little bit more uh, complex. So to be able to apply it in the correct way, one should at least uh, be aware of it. and having a more than, I think, basic knowledge of environmental law and also have access to specialized sources concerning legislation, legal writings, and so on. And in my opinion, to apply it correctly, one should also have a basic knowledge of the environment as such, its functioning and its main and the main threats to it. And that should apply, I think, for the whole enforcement chain from, for example, environmental inspectors, police, customs, over prosecutors to uh, judges. So I must say that the European Commission has given an important boost to environmental law training for the judiciary by setting up a project which is called cooperation with judges uh, in the field of environmental law and this program started in 2008 it uh, run in the first period of was run by in the first period by IPA and in the second period by uh, the 
uh, era uh, in Trier. And 12 different training modules have been developed. And more than 500 judges and public prosecutors have attended at least one uh, of those seminars. So I should say the knowledge and insight in European Union environmental law has received in so doing an important boost. But of course, that effort should be doubled, maybe tripled or more, by the member state judicial training institutions. Because the European Union trainings have mainly been conducted in English, and that's a handicap for an important number of judges and prosecutors within the European Union, of course, with variations between the member states, I suppose it's not a problem for Ireland and as long as it's still in the transition period for the UK, but in some other countries that that language uh, could be a, a, a problem. And as national courts apply, in essence, transposed European environmental law, so domestic law transposing European environmental law, and domestic law, and only exceptionally directly European law, national training should focus on those aspects of environmental law, so the transposed uh, model of European uh, environmental law in the domestic framework. A particular form of training is a result of networking through uh, organizations like uh, uh, the European Union Forum of uh, Judges for the Environment or the Working Group uh, on Environmental Law of the Association of European uh, Administrative uh, Judges and also EGTN and other associations like the Association of Supreme Administrative Courts and Council of States from time to time are working in that field uh, of uh, law. But of course, training is useless if the knowledge cannot be used in daily practice. Therefore, some form of specialization in environmental law is necessary so that the trained judges and the trained prosecutors can it apply it on a daily basis and are not after a, 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 let's say, comprehensive training in environmental uh, law uh, have to deal uh, with uh, family matters or uh, other kinds uh, of law. I must say that globally, there is a tendency to create environmental courts and tribunals in various forms uh, on most continents. But Europe is somewhat an exception to that. And we see the creation of, for example, to, to cite something, more than 1,500 environmental courts in China, uh, for example. But we, we see also environmental courts and tribunals in uh, some countries in Africa, in other countries in Asia. We see it uh, also, for example, in uh, uh, Australia. And in my opinion, uh, the, the, the best example uh, is still uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Environmental Land Court of the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales in Australia, because there you have a combination of administrative law and review of administrative decisions and regulations by the judiciary, the application of civil law and criminal law, so also the enforcement. Uh, through uh, civil law and through a uh, criminal law is in one specialized court with not only trained lawyers uh, in it, but also, uh, let's say, uh, technical uh, 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 judges. But of course, the form of specialization can be uh, different from uh, country to country according to their own traditions, etc. Et but I think we need uh, some uh, form of uh, specialization, be it uh, uh, in the administrative judiciary where you have uh, designated 
be it courts or, or sections or chambers, so that uh, environmental law can be practiced uh, in on a daily basis by uh, uh, trained uh, judges, uh, by trained uh, public prosecutors, if we speak about uh, criminal uh, law, uh, for example. And that could, in my uh, opinion, also contribute to an important aspect of adjudication of environmental cases, that is speed, timeliness. So we see uh, in a lot of countries that uh, courts, uh, judges have uh, an important backlog, that uh, cases are decided, uh, they are, sometimes it's uh, indicated they're won on paper, but lost on the ground because meanwhile, the situation has been uh, changed uh, in practice uh, uh, already. And if you have a form of specialization, if you have a uh, form of, of uh, training, then I believe that cases can be handled uh, in a more uh, uh, speeded, speeded up way than we see in general uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, our daily practice. So uh, these are some uh, suggestions. So I leave it uh, to you for uh, the next uh, panelist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke, and thank you in particular for, for keeping to time. And I think you covered very well the importance of judicial training and also the trend that we're seeing globally um, in the development of specialist environmental courts and tribunals. And I'm sure we'll see a lot of questions and discussion hopefully around that um, after this, these presentations. So I turn now to our next contributor, Jerzy Jendroska. Uh, Jerzy is managing partner at Jendroska Germaniski Bar and Partners. He's adjunct professor at Opol University in Poland and at the Riga Graduate School of Law. He is, of course, a long-standing member of the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee and also a member of the EU expert group on access to environmental justice. And Jersey will consider this morning the difference between access to justice in Article 9.2 and Article 9.3 of the Convention. He will look at administrative versus judicial review and also approaches regarding the scope, <clears throat> the scope of review. So I look forward to your contribution, Jersey. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you, thank you, uh, 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 thank you, Anya. Indeed, uh, what I would like to to start, however, is uh, with some reflection of uh, the access to justice provision in the Aarhus Convention, uh, which is kind of a reference point for all of us uh, related to the Aarhus uh, 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 to the uh, access to justice issue. Uh, and this may shed some light on the understanding uh, uh, because of this, this issue. Uh, Luke mentioned training for judges and also the wonderful exa um, example of uh, New South Wales uh, uh, and Luke and maybe some other colleagues would remember that uh, it was sometimes in the 90s, mid 90s, for the first time in Europe where Paul Stein, who was the, the, the founding member and the judge from the New South Wales uh, uh, court, visited Europe and how much we were all impressed by this. And 25 years uh, more or less passed and this is still a, a future. So it's it's just a reflection uh, on what looked at. Uh, and, and the second reflection is, uh, and that's what I'm going to took a bit is that access to justice is not confined only to judicial review. But first of all, about the history uh, uh, of the convention. Originally, when we started negotiations of the convention in uh, uh, at the late 90s, uh, 
it was clear understanding that uh, you have uh, uh, procedural rights the convention is about procedural rights uh, right to information and right to participate and then it should be associated with the mechanism to protect this right so originally access to justice was considered to be a mechanism to protect the rights procedural rights then uh, started by Belgium actually and later uh, Mark Palamats uh, under late Mark Palamats uh, um, uh, leadership there was a discussion about right to environment which finally found its way into article 1 uh, which is meant to be well, it is a substantive right right to the environment and the procedural rights are mechanism to to um, implement it so that uh, opened the way to seeing access to justice in a more broader way and that's why for example in article 9.2 we have not only procedural legality to be challenged of decisions administrative decisions but also substantive legality and even more importantly that's article 9.3 which has, in fact, nothing to do with the procedural rights of information or participation, but it is a kind of a mechanism to protect the right to the environment, uh, or, if you will, uh, as a mechanism to uh, enforce the law, environmental law. Originally, we thought it would be like something like a citizen suit in the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, I will come back maybe to this uh, later on. Uh, ev uh, eventually, the way it is drafted uh, opens a uh, uh, possibility for uh, various uh, interpretations. Uh, but what is important is that this approach to access to justice found its way into the preamble where you you see uh, a reference to the access to justice uh, as a means to protect the legitimate interest or rights if you will because that that's that's pretty much uh, uh, the same uh, approach and enforcement of the law which is like an objective uh, uh, legality of the law so access to justice has this dual functions so that is the about the history now article 9 2 and 9 3 uh, and you could find uh, a bit of this distinction embedded into the, the the way both articles are drafted i must admit first of all it is a result of very heavy negotiations, both articles. So, uh, trying to see a logical structure in it, as if it was like a one clear concept uh, included into the law, that's not the way to do it. You, you all need to understand that it was the compromise of uh, uh, between different approaches and that was what was uh, at that time possible to be included into the convention so sometimes there are different uh, uh, institutions different wording terminology so these differences not always necessarily must reflect totally different uh, uh, concepts uh, nevertheless, some concept behind them uh, uh, may be found. Uh, so the the difference uh, uh, between nine two is uh, uh, and the nine three is first of all in the standing issue. Who can trigger these procedures? Uh, and obviously, in in nine two, it is a reference to. Uh, uh, members of the public concerned who have uh, sufficient interest or impairment of rights, including environmental NGOs. And there is a cross-reference to Article 2.5 about who is the public concerned. 
this recently was a, 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 a matter of debate in uh, whether all those who have uh, access to public participation right should have access to to justice under Article 9.2. Uh, and that was the original intention. Uh, and uh, Advocate Bobak, in his recent opinion, uh, 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 argumented or, or advocated for this approach. On the other hand, that seemed to be leading to limiting a bit the scope of those who can participate uh, and, and that was also what we had in the in the discussion where finally it was meant to be limited to those who have uh, sufficient interest and finally uh, sufficient was uh, deleted from the notion of public participation uh, of public concern so we have only those who have interest in decision making not sufficient interest but it was left in 9-2. Uh, so we, we have this discrepancy between uh, uh, those who can participate and those who can challenge the decisions. But that's the first issue uh, in 9-2. In 9-3, it's, it's just members of the public meeting the criteria. And it is not open-ended uh, and we in the compliance committee we, we we made it crystal clear that this is not uh, a fully discretionary uh, uh, right of member state of parties to to set this criteria then uh, the difference between 92 and 93 is uh, about what uh, or who should be the the the, the review body and in 92 it is clear that it talks about uh, judicial or quasi judicial procedures well, that, that is a court of law or impartial and independent body created by law and that is a difference with 93 and also 91 which includes also administrative review also different worded uh, uh, i will come back to this administrative review in a moment and then finally what could be challenged and it's clear that in 9 2 these are acts or omissions uh, related to article mm, uh, 6 predominantly that is a public participation and that means this is about administrative decisions whereas in 9 3 we talk about act of omissions of private persons and public authorities uh, which uh, includes the possibility for civil criminal and other procedures and not only administrative uh, uh, procedures this has a uh, um, um, importance for continental systems in which you have a special administrative uh, uh, bodies because uh, traditionally in continental Europe access to justice is considered as a matter for administrative courts and that is the matter of debate uh, and we forget about civil and uh, criminal procedures we forget about the uh, Council of Europe relevant convention like Lugano Convention, which was uh, uh, very much uh, uh, debated at the time when we uh, we were negotiated the Aarhus Convention, and it was really for us uh, uh, one of the models. Unfortunately, it never entered into force. Uh, so that is the difference, uh, 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 and finally, uh, it is uh, uh, the. Uh, this difference, uh, uh, whereas you could say that in 92 it is about protection of rights and procedural rights and to some extent legality of the decisions, but it is confined to those decisions that, uh, that are covered by the Article 6. Uh, and in Article uh, uh, 9.3, we have a wide range of uh, issues covered it's much open-ended but it includes 
also this uh, administrative uh, uh, and uh, uh, judicial procedures. And it is worded in a way that it is all in uh, 9.2, requirements relates to judicial procedures under the court of law or independent and impartial body. It allows also for the administrative review, but this is not the must, it is just a possibility to be introduced. Whereas in Article 9.3, it is uh, a requirement relates to administrative or judicial procedures. Uh, so that could uh, uh, cover different um, means. And then if you look at Article 9.1, one of these means is reconsideration by the same authority, uh, which uh, for the purpose of 9.3 uh, uh, seems to be the weakest possible way of access to justice. We have three minutes okay. left. Okay, so I'm I'm coming to the uh, uh, the main issue, which is the well, maybe to the conclusions. So access to justice uh, uh, covers uh, judiciary and administrative procedures generally. Only in nine two, which is a, a, a part of of the issue, it's it's just only judicial procedures. Then the issue is, if we talk about judges, the, the first issue is what should be the scope of the review, cassatory or reformatory? And that is one of the discuss, uh, issues to discussed in, in, throughout Europe. And obviously, uh, uh, in the administrative procedures, you have both, and quite often you have reformatory uh, uh, approach. And for reformatory, uh, you need this expertise for uh, the cassatory functions. The technical expertise is maybe uh, less important, but still important, and I agree with, with, with Luke. However, I'm not sure that the having inside technical judges uh, as an internal expertise, it is the best way, uh, and definitely in Europe, uh, uh, the... the, the, the experience with the uh, uh, panels uh, uh, in the Court of Justice uh, is, is quite uh, telling that uh, it is rather, uh, the trend now is rather to have uh, omnibus uh, or courts rather than, than specialized courts. But uh, the other approach is the external expertise. And here I think it is uh, uh, quite useful this uh, uh, Dutch experience with the uh, um, foundation of court experts in environmental and planning law. And I think this is a very useful uh, uh, approach uh, uh, to help judges. Uh, what are the key issues? I think it is first that all procedures are covered by the possibility to trigger some kind of review. Now we have a lot of problems with sectoral laws uh, and we have a number of cases against a number of countries for not granting access to justice outside 9.2 and especially for, for NGOs. So uh, it is for me quite clear that whatever even insufficient review is better than no possibility of external review at all. Uh, that's first. Second, uh, it is... Uh, uh, wide standing is needed. So that means uh, all the, um, both the private persons and the authorities who apply environmental law know that someone is watching them and this someone has a uh, means to uh, trigger external independent review. Whether this review is, is perfect, it's a different issue, as I said, and, and, and here is the issue whether it's only legal or it's also uh, covering substantive issues uh, uh, and technical issues, but the mere possibility for triggering external uh, uh, review, for me, it's, it's the key one, issue. So One minute left. Yeah, I'm finishing. I'm finishing, Konya. So, 
two issues real effective uh, access to justice must be promoted by uh, extending access to justice to all environmental law uh, procedures and widening the scope of access to justice thank you thank you very much indeed jersey for that absolutely fascinating analysis of the text of article 92 and article 93 of the convention and I think it's particularly important the way you explained to us how the ultimate text depends so often on a very difficult compromise being reached between those who are drafting a difficult texts. And this is the same, I imagine, in the context of drafting of European Union law directives. And those compromises, the, the shape of the text then leads, of course, to challenges to interpret the, the true meaning of the text. And we're fortunate that we've had you as such an authority, somebody who was actually involved in the drafting of the convention and, and to give us those, ex those excellent insights. And I was also impressed with how you linked back to the points about judicial specialization that Luke made so eloquently in his earlier contribution. And to remind everybody who's tuning in and watching, please feel free to use the chat function and also, of course, to send in your questions and um, I'll review the questions as they come in and, and gather them together as best I can so we can put them to our excellent contributors. So we turn now to our next contributor and it's my enormous pleasure to introduce Shaba Kiss. Shaba Kiss is environmental attorney at Environmental Management and Law Association uh, at Budapest. His field of work is environmental legal research and litigation, and he also coordinates the Justice and Environment Network of EU Public Interest Environmental Law Organisations. And I look forward very much, Shaba, to, to hearing your contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm very sorry that because of the COVID situation, we are not able to sit in uh, nice and rainy Brussels in a conference room. Instead, I welcome you from a dark and rainy Budapest. Um, my topic will be uh, how to promote access rights and allow me to, um, to kind of uh, put on a hat of an activist, an activist lawyer and approach it from rather the user uh, perspective than from an authoritative or a decision maker perspective. Um, I think that access to justice in environmental matters is, uh, has a dual, dual feature, a dual face. Uh, first of all, it is, it is heavy legal uh, science. And as uh, Luke started his uh, presentation saying that uh, this is a complicated uh, matter, uh, yes, I can only agree with that. Uh, on the other hand, its users are laypersons. So there is a huge gap between the difficulty, the, com uh, the complexity of environmental law and its application at the court, and between the knowledge of the users, uh, even in case of, of specialized uh, environmental NGOs, who are, by the way, not specialized lawyers. So I think we need four components to promote access rights. One is public awareness raising. The second one is targeted training. The third is active civil society, and the last but not least is vivid academic life. I'll not talk about the targeted training because both uh, the preceding uh, presenters, Luke and Yerji, uh, touched upon this issue. So first of all, public awareness raising, and I do apologize if the, um, the letter, the font size is too small to read. I'm gonna actually read out uh, what's up there. Um, and when you get the presentations, uh, um, you will be able to use each uh, item as a link as well. So uh, I, of course, was not able to go into details in each and every uh, EU member state how they promote access rights in terms of how they train or, or raise the awareness of the public. So that's why I focused on more like the EU level uh, efforts. And we can see that the European Commission is doing a lot uh, in promoting access rights, as well as there are a lot of uh, very valuable uh, resource materials where you can get uh, quite insightful information about uh, access to justice, both on the EU level and in each and every member state. First, 
uh, to start with, there is an e-justice portal on environmental access to justice. Um, that portal has been set up in 2012, 13, and now it is under updating. Um, I respectfully ask uh, any representative of the commission if uh, we have uh, one present uh, among the, the spectators to write in the chat box when it is uh, foreseeable to have a renewed, updated version of the e-justice portal, where you actually go and you can have com uh, comprehensive information on how to get access to uh, justice in environmental matters. This is actually managed by DG Justice. There are a lot of other materials that include partial or complete information about how to access justice. For instance, the environmental governance assessment reports that just came out last year, or the governance assessment uh, final report, which is a very valuable comparative analysis of uh, environmental governance across uh, the EU, but also includes uh, information about uh, member states. Um, we all know that there's been, uh, many years ago, a compliance committee finding about the non-compliance of the EU with the Aarhus Convention, uh, whereas the, the Court of Justice of the EU is not giving enough access to people, uh, especially NGOs, in uh, cases. That triggered a chain of uh, reactions, and one of the reactions is a report on the Aarhus Convention implementation across the EU. Uh, that was done by Milieu Limited, a consulting company that also includes very important information about access to justice. And then last but not least, let's uh, mention uh, as an information material, the Environmental Implementation Review, uh, the EIR, and the country reports. There are more direct, by the way, more direct uh, materials that help uh, the people get acquainted with, with access to justice, for instance, the Commission Notice on Access to Justice in Environmental Matters, dating back to 2017, uh, which was accompanied, luckily, by a citizen guide in all the languages of the EU on how to get access to justice. We actually promote that material uh, widely at our events and training uh, sessions. And the last one is just fresh out of the oven, is uh, commission communication on improving access to justice. It's just a few days old. And although my time is uh, uh, running out fast, let me just read out a few sentences from this communication. Um, very importantly, the commission reiterates that the public is and should remain a driving force of the green transition and should have the means to get more actively involved in developing and implementing new policies there is a direct reference to the European Green Deal, which is actually the backbone of, uh, of the actions of the Commission um, in terms of greening the economy as well as greening the public administration and the governance of the EU. Um, there is a very direct call when the Commission says, the Commission calls on member states to step up implementation of applicable EU laws. Well, that's kind of a... Uh, sentence that can be understood in many ways. So to help the, the construction of this sentence, the Commission is getting more specific uh, when it says there are four priority areas. First, to secure the correct transposition of EU secondary law. Second, the co-legislators, the Council and the Parliament, to include provisions on access to justice in EU legislative proposals made by the Commission. Actually, it's a really important call uh, to, to include the sectoral, into the sectoral directives, an access to justice provision, each of them, instead of having an overarching access to justice directive. Third, um, review by the member states of their own national legislative and regulatory provisions. And fourth, the obligation of national courts to guarantee the right of individuals and NGOs to an effective remedy under EU law. Of course, there are also other initiatives besides, uh, and other sources besides the uh, European Commission's materials where to get information about uh, access to justice and which can help promoting awareness raising. Very obviously, the UNEC National Implementation Report submitted to the meetings of the parties is a very uh, uh, rich source of information. 
Um, let me be selfish a little bit. Let me call the attention to the Earl project, which is actually the, the umbrella for this uh, online conference as well. Uh, we, uh, Client Terrorism, and Justice and Environment, produced a guide on access to justice in European Union law. All the countries, all participating countries, eight actually, uh, produce country toolkits in uh, national languages. And we created an interactive platform for Estonia, Hungary, Poland as a pilot project. This also includes an ask the lawyer or ask a lawyer function. And we created an access to justice lawyer database where you can find 100, uh, more than 100, I think 113 uh, public interest environmental lawyers across the EU, not only from the eight countries that participate in the project. And if you're not fed up yet with this abundance of information, then you can just go to the Word Justice Forum, Word Justice Project, or the EU Justice Scoreboard, and you get, uh, again, a whole lot of information. But what to get with this information? Um, I know it's still early to say Merry Christmas, but what I wanted to say with this picture is that we have a lot of gifts. The problem is now to get down the chimney and uh, I think even Santa would get stuck with this much information. Training is the one that helps uh, the information get to the users. And as I said in the beginning, we are, I'm not talking about that because Luke and Yerji already did. The fourth component, which I mentioned, is the active civil society. Uh, third component out of the four is this, the active civil society. Uh, again, I did not go into detail to what extent the uh, certain member states have active uh, NGOs in environmental matters, but again, using the opportunity to be selfish is to call the attention to the uh, coordinating beneficiary of this ERP project, the Association of Justice and Environment. We have members, member NGOs from 12 countries, as you can look at the map. And we provide pro bono national environmental legal service. Almost uh, each uh, member organization does that uh, on the national level. Uh, but we also do EU and UNEC level cases. We submitted communication to the compliance committee. We uh, try to achieve the transparency of infringement uh, documentation at the Court of Justice of the EU. We have publications on access to justice to promote um, public uh, awareness. 157 entries since 2006 on the Aarhus Convention. And we do uh, organize events, including this training session, uh, but also uh, training sessions for the judiciary and public administration or attorneys, uh, members of the bar uh, in all eight countries. And the last slide is what I was talking about, is the the vivid academic life. I think that's also needed for the promotion of uh, access to justice. Um, as I said, there is a component, an activist component. Uh, the users, with their sometimes lack of knowledge, come, but they want to use the law, uh, the legal uh, um, avenues. And this is the, the, the role of academics to analyze uh, judicial decisions, um, uh, legislative changes, legal amendments, etc., new new legal uh, new bills, new proposals. To what extent they affect uh, access to justice um, in environmental matters? I think we can't complain. Uh, the ac the academic life is really vivid and lively. I just did a really quick search by Google Scholar, and I just set it for two uh, two thousand and twenty. And all of a sudden, there was, a, again, an abundance of, of uh, sources where to get information, just the, the, the most important, a research handbook on environmental law, an LLB thesis with the very provocative question, has the adoption of the Aarhus Convention advanced the legal standing of NGOs, etc.? Another a treatise on compliance mechanism under the Aarhus Convention. So we can say that there is a lot of information, the task, uh, the upcoming task is to, to as I said, to move the, the gifts down the chimney to, to make sure that it gets to the users and it really ends up and results in the, an elevated level of knowledge and the better uh, increased, improved public awareness in the users to use access to justice and contribute to the policy um, of the EU also 
uh, to, to implement the Green Deal in the long run. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salva, for that excellent presentation and for, for keeping so perfectly to time, which is greatly appreciated. Uh, I must say I found your framework of analysis, the, the four points that you started out with, very helpful, as I'm sure our participants did as well. Uh, the public awareness element is so important and that the public has access to information that's understandable and that is freely available. That link that you made between information and training is so important. And certainly as somebody who works at a university myself, I fully agree with you, the important role that the academy has to play here. And also I think those of us who teach environmental law and also climate law, the role we have to support and develop the future lawyers, the next generation of public interest lawyers, the next generation, uh, and to inspire and support them as best we can. So thank you for raising those issues and to remind people again to keep using the chat, which is getting very busy, and to also send in your questions. So I turn now to um, our final contributor in this particular session, Marie Toussaint. Marie is a lawyer and climate justice activist. She co-founded the association Notre Affaire à Tout and is at the origin of L'Affaire du Siècle, the case of the century. Elected as a Green MEP in May 2019, she sits on the Environment, Industry and Legal Affairs Committees. And it's my very great pleasure now to invite Marie to address us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ayn. Uh, and thank you, everyone. That's my first point. Uh, thank you and congratulations, um, because all the work, all the huge work that has been done uh, by, by Clienturf was so important um, and its partners was so important that we finally get uh, yesterday the communication and the legislative proposal from the Commission. And I don't know if it was done on purpose, how you could know about this date of release. But I think it's quite uh, impressive that uh, we're holding uh, these conferences just at the moment when the Commission decides to uh, modify the IRS Convention. On that uh, issue, I would, by the way, have a remark because the, IRS, the, the change in the IRS Convention was not publicized by the European Commission. What they told me is that they hadn't put it in the calendar of work, in the program of work of the Commission, because they were afraid that too many people, member states, companies, stakeholders, they didn't precise, uh, were so much opposed to a change in the IRS legislation that they wanted to do it quite discreetly. Um, so now we have it on the table, it's quite good, and we need to build on, um, this, uh, uh, on these two proposals, the communication on, on, on one point, uh, on one hand, uh, considering um, especially the access to justice in national courts and member states and the legislative proposal to change a bit the IRS uh, regulations, EU regulation uh, on the other side. Um, so I also wanted to give you um, anecdotes and I think that you talked about it uh, also in the previous sessions. But when we look at the problem, what are the problems uh, right now? Um, well, I, I can give you three examples on which we've been building um, uh, our climate, but also environmental cases, before I switch to the parliament uh, work. Um, with La Faire du Siècle, we had um, this uh, uh, so climate inaction, um, case for climate inaction by, the by, by, the, by France, uh, that was launched in December uh, 2018. We're now waiting for the conclusions of the tribunal. It takes a bit of time, it's normal, uh, but we don't know yet if we're going to have um, an acceptability by the tribunal. Why is that? It's because Notre Affaire à tous doesn't have the agreement given by the French state to be able to defend uh, the environment. And what I wanted to point out here is that something I don't hear so often actually, is that when is the state giving the agreement to allow NGOs to go in justice against the state? That's one of the main issues, right? Um, there, then you have a problem because it's the same people who decide who is able to go uh, in justice uh, against them, right, For to establish their responsibility. And that's something that we should really work so that criteria, independent, solid, uh, 
uh, autonomous criteria should be set up uh, for the governments not to decide who is able to uh, access to justice. And in France, what we've seen during the last 10 years is a decrease, a diminution per two, division per two of the number of NGOs that are able to reach out to justice. Um, the second uh, anecdote, of course, is the, the people's climate case, uh, where we had uh, a blockade with diplomat calls uh, in front of the EUCJ. Um, and one of the reasons was that, uh, of course, this was not an act of general uh, reach, um, that, of course, the violations of the rights of the families was um, agreed on, and that, of course, we can think about a stronger climate action from the Commission, but, uh, you know, not, not uh, they were uh, directly, but not individually, because not uniquely uh, impacted by, by climate change. So in that regard, the Commission just opened some doors to allow uh, NGOs, if the text is adopted, of course, to allow NGOs to um, access to the EUCJ way more than uh, what it is what is possible now, but they keep on restraining access to justice for individuals. So we will still be in the same situation if the text is adopted as it is, um, which is a real problem for access to fundamental rights, of course. So this is also something that we'll need to fight for. But I want to raise a point as well in the strategic issue is that the Commission is saying that uh, enlarging access to justice won't cost anything or will deplace, uh, displace the costs, but won't, be, uh, won't create additional costs. Whereas what we know is also that if we want to allow more access to justice on environmental matters, like on other matters, we also need an increase in the budget and in the human resources of the courts. And this is a very concrete issue. But then what is the strategic fight, right? Do we fight for more access to justice and then ask for human resources and, and budget? Or do we do the contrary? So this is one point I throw in the, in the discussion. The third anecdote, and then I will go to the parliamentary work. Um, the third anecdote is that uh, we have many um, uh, infringements in, in environmental law that we don't know about because we don't build the data. I'm thinking about the chlordecone in anti, um, uh, the impacts of asbestos, uh, of pesticides. And of course, when, when we create the environmental data, we often have a problem of transparency, independence, uh, the presence of the lobbies in the, in the places where we build the information. Uh, but we also have the, the problem that we don't build, we don't invest, we don't research uh, to get all this data. Um, and right now we're, we're fighting and I think that we will manage uh, to get more money, uh, to get more information uh, and more indicators uh, on the planetary boundaries. We also are working to get more um, knowledge about the crossing between environmental and social injustices, which is quite important if we also want to ally uh, our, when using our tools, ally environmental uh, law, but also social law, fundamental rights law and stuff that you know, it will help us a lot um, uh, reaching out our goals. So I'm already five minutes speaking, so I will turn directly to the um, the, the, the discussion uh, on in the in the European Parliament. First thing I'd like to say is that um, we are aware in the European Parliament that there is a problem uh, on access to justice. What we do, and it's a uh, funny somehow because um, the Commission just told us, uh, well, requests requested us to pay more attention to the uh, European Parliament, but also to the Member States, to pay more attention when we draft new legislative pieces to make sure that we have provisions for access to justice. So here we are quite aware of this, but we do not always find the ways to ensure it. In the climate law, we have proposed um, a better access to justice to ensure that member states will respect each five years target considering um, climate the, the reach uh, of the climate goals. Um, this is better than what the Commission has proposed. We hope it's going to uh, live through the Council, but this is not really this is not enough uh, yet. So we, we would need to find other ways to ensure that we have access to justice in climate-related matters. Uh, on the deforestation file that we're voting uh, next week, here again, we've introduced 
some provisions for allowing uh, access to justice. This is not a legislative proposal yet, it's the proposal from the Parliament uh, only, but we've been trying to do so. One of the problems is that we have, and we will have this problem in the case of the due diligence uh, legislation in the EU, uh, but we have the access to justice from European citizens, and we ha also have to find ways for uh, a third country citizens to reach uh, out to, to, to justice. So this is something that we are really paying attention to. I hope that the discussion on the legislative proposal of the Commission um, that was released yesterday will be discussed quite soon uh, in um, the European Parliament. It's quite good. Um, I mean, it's a really good proposal, and I feel that there is a, a real sincerity in the proposal that is made um, to broaden the scope, uh, to allow for more time uh, to reach to, out to tribunals, um, to have a scrutiny on the implementation, to uh, alarm on the costs of uh, the environmental justice actions in the member states. So, a lot of good things there, um, but to end up with my presentation, I'd like to focus also on what is missing. Um, and uh, first, within the context, within the scope of the uh, proposal from the Commission, um, I told you about this necessity to have independent criteria to grant access to justice, to allow access to justice to the NGOs. Uh, so this is something that uh, seems really important for me. The second thing is that um, we have to uh, build this information uh, on environment that I told you about. And the third thing, that, which I don't see appearing in the, in the communication and the legislative proposal from the Commission, is to um, develop processes to accompany uh, the NGOs and the individu individuals who want to have access to information and also to go in justice. And for instance, when we have um, criminal investigation, for instance, I was seeing people in the chat talking about the uh, environmental crime. Uh, when we have criminal investigations, no one is alerted. Uh, so also, uh, you cannot intervene in the procedure because you're, you, you don't have the information that the procedure is going on. All these kind of things should be uh, discussed and prepared somewhere. Um, and this is something that I think should have been uh, in the proposal of the Commission. Then we have two complementary proposals. One uh, that was already discussed by the previous participants is the fact that we need uh, specialized tribunals, specialized judge, judges, uh, specialized uh, prose prosecutors. Um, we need these courts, these courts uh, to work uh, in the EU to exist. Also, maybe give the, the Tribunal of the European Union uh, the new parquet. I forgot the, the name. Uh, but yeah, to grant it uh, the environmental um, the environmental uh, uh, competence, uh, but we really need to work on that. And uh, member states are beginning to to do so. Um, but this is really urgent that we have something like this. And also because there is a lack of formation that was already addressed, and that is uh, really hard um, in the European Union. Then the second thing that came out actually of a, a report made for the French government in last February, environmental justice was the name of this report, um, is to create um, an ombudswoman or ombudsman, but I like the ombudswoman part, uh, for the environment and nature. And this would be something, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, um, that would be something that would really help. It would help bringing a uh, building and bringing some cases into the public debate and also maybe in court, but also to the legal representatives, political representatives, would they be in the EP or in the member states? And then really my last point, um, two last points actually, but um, we haven't talked during this meeting on the, the issue of the protection of nature defenders, of nature protectors. And we have a lot of issues even within the member states. We know about uh, 170 people, um, forest rangers, uh, arrest in, in Romania, six people, six of them were killed as well. We really need to have um, a, dis a mechanism on this and we are a group of MPs working on this. We know that the convention is also working and I'd be happy to hear about that, by the way, uh, as much as we need also an anti-slap legislation. And the last point for access to justice, to my mind uh, especially, uh, is that we need a legal standing for the ecosystems. We need to find uh, who could talk 
for the ecosystems, we need to recognize the rights of nature. This would allow way more NGOs than today to be able to go uh, in justice to defend the rights of the ecosystems to flourish, uh, to live at their natural rhythmism, um, to, to regenerate. And um, this is a, still a political discussion because who can talk on behalf of the ecosystems, right? But this is something that we really need to open. And this is a discussion that is beginning also at the EU level with my colleagues, with the commissioners, uh, and I hope with you, and I hope that we can also push this forward because I think that would be crucial in uh, ensuring environmental rights for all. Thank you very much indeed, Marie, for that absolutely excellent presentation. And you've managed to cover so many important issues in, in a very short space of time. Uh, and again, I think it's interesting how that strong theme about specialization of tribunals and of courts has come through in practically all four presentations that we've heard so far this morning. Uh, and also again, the, the significance of the timing of the, the commission's new proposal and I'm glad as well, without mentioning any particular jurisdictions, I'm glad as well that you've raised that really crucial issue about protection of um, the defenders of nature and the defenders of environmental um, human rights. Uh, and hopefully some of those topics will, will come up again in our chat and in our questions. So it's also, of course, fascinating to hear your inside perspectives from the work of the European Parliament. And again, I think that's something that we can come back to during our questions and discussion. So I'm going to turn now to the questions that have come in in the course of the proceedings. Um, there are quite a few. And again, feel free to um, feel free to continue to use the chat function. Um, I'm doing my best to uh, choose the questions in an order that makes sense. And I might start with a, a general question uh, and then move into some of the more specific ones so we can get best value from the time that we have available. So I think it's appropriate to start with a question from Anis. Um, from Client Earth, who uh, puts this question to um, Jersey, but again, others might want to con contribute. Um, and I think it's a wide ranging, interesting question, which is what evolution have you witnessed in the non compliance issues that have been raised in communications that have come to the Compliance Committee over the years? Uh, and how do state parties, generally speaking, react to them? Um, and again, I think somebody of your great experience, um, Jersey, who would have seen over very many years how things have evolved in, in a general sense, obviously without getting into the details of specific cases, have you seen an evolution um, in, in how the Compliance Committee is being used and, and, and matters related to that? Thank you. Shall I reply right now, Anya? Yes, I think it would be best and to, to keep it as brief as possible just to, to, to start the discussion. Okay, uh, two issues. It is clear that uh, everyone is learning from the experience. So when we started uh, uh, the uh, compliance, I mean, when the mechanism entered into force and uh, when the compliance committee was created, first, cases were rather straightforward uh, and I must admit uh, some of the countries uh, that uh, were brought to the compliance committee have had a lot of problems with uh, um, compliant. So we had long-standing cases. Uh, even though they were relatively uh, easy. Now we are getting more and more complicated cases uh, and we have learned how to follow up the cases which is uh, 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 more and more time we're spending on uh, monitoring how the countries react to our uh, 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 recommendations also the recommendations are getting more and more concrete so originally the recommendations were were rather general improve access to justice of, of uh, public participation now the recommendations sometimes are very very concrete and we are scrupulously follow these recommendations and most of the recommendations is about 
changing the legal framework in the countries. So it takes years for countries to come up with meaningful proposals. Also, we uh, look at this. And even if you look at the European Union, this case brought by client S many years ago, uh, eventually, as I learned only yesterday, ended up with a new legislative proposal for the Orwell's regulation change, which it was on our table uh, for many years. You remember, I was, uh, I don't know, 10 years or more that, that it was on the table. So it is a slow process, but I think generally countries, with some few exceptions, few exceptions, I'm not going to name and shame anyone, uh, are, are very receptive uh, and are trying to do their best within the circumstances, but it's a slow process. But I can assure you, we treat it very, very serious. And I, I think nowadays, follow-up, monitoring follow-up, uh, gets much of our attention. I would have thought maybe it is uh, something in a range of 40%. Uh, only I would perhaps uh, have different view, but I think it's, it's as compared with a couple of years uh, uh, ago time where it was really a margin of our activity now it is really a serious job so we take it oh, seriously oh. yeah oh, that, yes and uh, thank you i think that's very helpful to give participants generally just a, a sense of the process before the compliance committee and again how it has evolved over time as you said cases have tended to become more complex and the responses are more challenging for state parties and for others. So thank you, your Jersey, for, for that excellent contribution. Well, yeah, uh, turning to add to something which is important, I, I think it would be useful to add that we keep involved the public in this uh, uh, monitoring uh, uh, and scrutiny, the, the communicant, but also the other public. And we always require countries, governments, that whatever they do, that should be discussed with the public at large. So I think it is an important element. Yes, uh, very much so. And I agree with you. And I, I wish we had more time to, to continue on that theme and hopefully we can come back to it on another occasion. But moving now to another question that is, again, I think of wider general interest. And this was the first question that was directed to Luke. Um, and it asks about the different extent um, to which judges in different jurisdictions apply direct effect um, and the differences between the extent to which judges seek preliminary rulings and um, is there any way to deal with those issues in terms of training and information that's provided, I assume, to judges? And, um, and um, Luke has already referred to a, an upcoming conference in Slovenia that will be looking at some of those issues regarding the preliminary rulings. But, but Luke, perhaps you can, um, in, in a brief way, make the points that you think are most appropriate in response to, to that very excellent question. Thank you. So uh, uh, I have referred to the uh, European training program, so the cooperation with judges program, and I've seen in the, the chat that uh, Adam Notch has also uh, uh, mentioned this. And I think one of the, uh, the most important uh, uh, trans uh, horizontal trainings was dealing with this issue of uh, direct effect, direct applicability, uh, uh, and so on. So I have the impression, but I have no scientific data that uh, in the field of environmental law, uh, in various member states, uh, the level of knowledge uh, of this by judges and the application of this is growing but i cannot say that the situation is perfect i think you are still in a learning uh, in a learning uh, 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 phase but uh, i think the tendency in general is uh, uh, positive uh, uh, what uh, the, the direct application is concerned and the use of uh, uh, european environmental law to 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 review uh, administrative uh, decisions and so on on, on, on the national level. 
that's uh, let's say a general statement but i have no statistics about the, the situation in the various uh, in the various uh, uh, member uh, state uh, we uh, also uh, in our annual conferences we are uh, uh, always uh, trying to exchange our experience with, with different parts of uh, european environmental law uh, so this year we, we we had our conference on air uh, air pollution just uh, last week so I invite you also to, to have a look to our website and uh, so all the materials from the, the various conferences uh, is uh, uh, there and the id for our annual conference uh, next uh, year is looking uh, to the follow-up so one can uh, raise uh, uh, preliminary references for preliminary rulings and also this is uh, is uh, is growing but then the next question is what uh, is the follow-up of this on the domestic uh, level both in the court cases where the question the the, the the reference is made but also of course which is uh, even important in similar uh, in similar cases uh, not uh, those cases uh, in which uh, as such the preliminary uh, ruling uh, intervenes so uh, i think there is already uh, some sort of uh, academic uh, research uh, on this i'm um, referring to the work of uh, lorenzo squintani from uh, groningen and the idea is to build uh, on this for our uh, next uh, annual conference because we're trying al always to, to work on the basis of national reports with a questionnaire to see how uh, the law is working in 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 uh, practice i am looking to my uh, clock and unfortunately i have to leave uh, the your conference because i have to go to another one <laughs> in uh, 50 minutes and i have to, to prepare for that so uh, so i I'm going to leave you and wish you much success with the, the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke, and I'm delighted we had you present to, to address that question. Thank you and, and, and um, have, have a good conference. Um, I'll move on very quickly to make the, the, the best use of time, and I see that um, more than one um, participant has, has asked a question that's directed towards Marie, and the question essentially is, could you explain to us further, Marie, why you think that recognizing the rights of nature might grant more environmental NGOs standing uh, and the person asking that question hopes that they haven't misunderstood your point and, and, and so is it the case that you're suggesting that recognizing the rights of nature uh, would, would lead to greater standing for environmental NGOs? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's what I mean uh, but um but that's not all. I mean, uh, I'm advocating for the recognition of the rights of nature uh, in the following, in the like in the inheritance also of the book written by Christopher Stone already in 1972 in the US. Um, that shows really well that when we defend the, the interests of the ecosystem itself, it gives a different results than when we defend the interests of the human beings, would they be also uh, the NGOs and the interest of the NGO with a social object? Do you say that in English, objet, objet social? Um, you know, when, once you have the status of your NGO, then you have to, you know, um, you have to describe, and then you are granted access to justice for that reason. So, and 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 then it would be different if you defend the ecosystems or the interests of your organization, even though it's of the general interest, right? So recognizing the rights of nature would have a concrete effect also on the protection of the ecosystems, but it would also help um, NGOs um, be able to reach out to justice because we need some people to defend the interests of the ecosystem. And I just want to point out also something that is also in the discussion on access to justice for uh, environmental reasons is that it can be NGOs, or if, for instance, in France, we're discussing about a public establishment for the Seine, which is one of our main rivers. If it's a published establishment, it 
must also have the right to access to justice, right, on behalf of the ecosystems. And we need to pay attention to this also for the collectivities and stuff. We also have public uh, uh, organ, organisms, establishments that need, um, that, that should be granted access to justice. Maybe one last point, because I see that time flies, and I saw one of the questions per, by Gert, um, which yes. I cannot really, really answer, because he knows the things uh, even more than I do, being a practitioner in that, in that area. But I just want to remind everyone that we are also discussing on the future of Europe and we are organizing these conventions. I'm not always really trustful into those conventions, but there will be a way to participate in the discussion regarding the future of Europe. And I believe that we should advocate a lot to change the, the, those two articles in the TFEU, uh, TFEU um, especially the, the article uh, 263. And we need this change in the treaties if we want to guarantee a real uh, access to justice in, uh, in environmental matters. Thank you very much, Marie, for those comments and for, for again covering so much in, in such a short space of time. Um, I'll move on quickly so we can get as many questions as possible. Uh, I see there is a very specific question about access to justice in Poland on the basis of Article 92 or 3 of the Aarhus Convention um, concerning alleged lack of strategic environmental assessment, Aarhus Article 7, for a Polish nuclear energy programme. Um, and again, there are particular comments made there in the question. I'm very conscious that as myself, as Vice Chair of the Compliance Committee and Jerzy Androska, as a serving member of the Compliance Committee, uh, I don't think it's appropriate in this forum to, to deal with um, uh, um, questions on specific cases. And it's not that I'm trying to avoid it, it's just simply to acknowledge that that's why um, I'm taking that particular approach. Um, and again, I would take the same approach if there were any other questions about specific cases, uh, because again, when, when judicial proceedings are live, whether it's before the Compliance Committee or before the Court of Justice or any other court, it, it's not appropriate. But again, people can note the question and consider the issues that are raised there um, and again, um, highlight those points if they wish to do so. Um, there's another question then asking, which areas of bar practice in the UK do we consider most relevant for public interest environmental law issues? Now, again, that's a very specific question concerning um, the, the barrister's profession in the United Kingdom. We don't have anybody on the panel from the United Kingdom. I could speak to the Irish situation, which is very different. Um, I, I just asked my colleague contributors if there's anything that anyone could add there. We could come back to it perhaps in session four, um, but I just wanted to acknowledge somebody asking what areas of practice within the bar in the UK are most relevant for public interest environmental law issues. We might come back to it in the next session. I can consult some colleagues, but it's an interesting question. And again, something that would be of interest, I imagine, to more junior practitioners who are considering building up or developing expertise in the area of environmental law. And we, we can come back to that. Um, I, I move then to another question concerning the Escazú agreement, which is um, uh, again, very, very significant and a, a very interesting new development. And the question says, the Escazú agreement includes interesting provisions on facilitating access to justice for vulnerable groups. Um, and again, it refers to uh, a particular decision of the Compliance Committee, but I'll leave that to one side. And the question is, in more general terms, how can we ensure that access to justice is available for vulnerable groups within the European Union? I think that's a very important question um, and suitably general for discussion here. Uh, and I wonder, is there any particular member of the panel who might like to come in on that point? Shabba, would you like yes. to? Yes, please. Yeah, very much. Um, <clears throat> I think that fits rather to the topic that I was talking about. Um, yeah, the Escazú Agreement is a is a milestone actually uh, for the Latin American region, and we who witnessed the 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 making of the convention and the the acceptance, and we are actually looking forward to its uh, entry into force. Uh, we noted uh, that there is a some kind of a. Um, Latin American flavor, a different uh, uh, approach to, to it, these issues. So the convention became more um, uh, sensitive to, to social issues 
and to vulnerable groups. Uh, I think that's something that we could take over uh, here in Europe also. Uh, however, definitely, it doesn't mean that I'm suggesting the, the amendment of the Aarhus Convention. Uh, we, I think there is a consensus that uh, that uh, kind of worms uh, should not be opened uh, at all. It may have uh, uh, negative uh, impacts on the current text also, so we, we, are, we must use the, the existing text. So the, to the question uh, now, uh, I think the way, the best way to, uh, to convey these messages to the vulnerable groups is to have in each and every member state uh, some kind of an intermediary or transmitting uh, uh, infrastructure, which are NGOs, uh, that can uh, take the message, take the, the information and, and the, the knowledge to, to the vulnerable groups. So I don't think and don't believe in the, the, um, the power of the state, the government, to be able to communicate with all segments of society. Some parts need uh, rather uh, uh, an NGO to, to get in touch with instead of uh, state officials, government officials. And uh, that's why I, we welcomed very much the, um, the online uh, consultation of the commission that was uh, last year about uh, the idea of uh, having uh, direct funding from the commission to legal aid uh, NGOs and rule of law uh, NGOs uh, in the member states. That's also kind of a um, a response to the growing uh, tendency of, uh, of uh, um, policies that do not fully respect rule of law, to put it mildly. Thank you. Uh, Jersey, would you please, Jersey? Yeah. Just, just a very short comment. Uh, I had a privilege to participate in, in both negotiations on Orhus and Escazu as well. In Escazu, I was a legal expert for. ECLAC, that is the uh, Latin America Commission, uh, UN Commission. Uh, and it was a striking difference. Whereas in Aarhus, the issue of vulnerable groups was uh, practically absent in the negotiations. We, we, we didn't discuss it. It was generally for, for the public, which all was considered it is not insufficient public participation and access to justice. But in, in the Escazo, and I agree with Chaba, it was this specific uh, Latin America flavor where this was really a big issue for the discussion because in all countries, they felt significant part of the society may be considered as vulnerable groups. So that was a striking difference with the situation in Europe. And when they were asking Kask uh, and myself about the experience in, in Europe, we were having difficulties in addressing this because we said that's almost non-existing issue in Europe. Uh, and yet only quite recently we are finding out that there are indeed, even in Europe, in EU, vulnerable groups that needs to, uh, which they need would need to be addressed. And finally, in, in the Maastricht recommendations on public participation, we started to address this issue and there was a bit of a discussion how to address the needs of vulnerable groups for the purpose of public participation, not, not on, on, on access to justice. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Jersey. Um, it, it's excellent to have that, that insight and, and your, your, your legendary expertise. Marie, do you, are you indicating you'd like to, to comment briefly? Yeah, really brief. Um, just to say it's really important to um, pose and ask this question. Um, and I was yesterday with the intergroup uh, to fight against poverty and uh, in favor of human rights in the European Parliament. We're talking about the environment because ecological and environmental justice is the main thematics of the UN uh, for this year's uh, tomorrow, uh, International Day of the Fight Against Poverty. Uh, so it's really important to find ways to include people um, in the policy making, right, in the environment especially, and also to guarantee access to justice. I want also to make a call here to, to us, um, because in, in the US they have fought a lot of environmental justice cases based on the uh, Discrimination Act of uh, 64. And here in the EU, we don't have so much, um, we didn't so much do that. And we really need to cross um, 
um, foreign people law, uh, I don't know how you call that, uh, uh, social law, fundamental rights law, and all these kind of things. This is really, really important. We begin to have a really good expertise uh, on housing and environment, but we need to keep on pushing for building this expertise as well. And then we'll be able to put it in the law. But first, let's take the, the matter uh, in hand on our side. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'm doing my best to, to cover as many questions as possible, and I'll come back to some of them in the second session when the wrap up at the very end. But um, Shaba, there is a question which I think is a good one and an interesting one directed to you, um, and I think it applies across all jurisdictions. And it's whether COVID and the fact that everything moved online meant that more judges were able to participate in um, the trainings, the judicial trainings that were offered, because sometimes it's easier just to, to attend online than have to make arrangements to, to travel and to be present. So I wonder, did you see an increase in uptake in judges participating in training because of the move to, to online platforms? Um, I would say yes, uh, I think, uh, as I said, we, we cover eight countries, um, and in some countries, the problem with uh, with judges participating at uh, personal uh, at conferences or, or training sessions based on personal encounter uh, was not only because of the COVID situation. It's it's more like uh, judicial independence. Some judges do not uh, think that it's appropriate to participate at uh, at uh, events called trainings held by NGOs. That may that hurdle may be overcome by, by having online trainings where we don't even have to know who is participating, uh, so judges are more free. I think uh, we experience that there are more um, uh, willingness of judges to participate. I think it happened in Slovakia and Austria, but then I'll have to check back to, to my colleagues. And I think we'll, we'll see how it goes in Hungary, because we are still to organize the last training out of six, and we'll go most probably online, and that will give the chance to the judges to to stay to keep their incognito, and then uh, still get the, the the training materials without compromising their their judicial independence. Thank you. I, I think that's an excellent answer, and certainly my own experience, I, I have come across judges who are quite sensitive about participating in various types of training again, because of the wish to protect their their um, their judicial independence. So that, that is very interesting about the online dimension. Uh, and just to say too, of course, with the move to online, even though we miss out on not meeting each other and chatting over a coffee today, having lunch together, sharing ideas, the online platform does mean, of course, that many people who would not have been able to travel to Brussels for this, if it was a live conference, um, are able to participate today and we're getting used to the chat function and to having the questions uh, and there are some really excellent questions here that I promise I will review during the break uh, and do my best to work them into the second session where we might have some more time. So my apologies to anybody um, and there are quite a few of you whose questions I've not been able to get to. What I would like to do now is to bring this um, third session of the conference to a formal close by thanking for absolutely excellent contributors who, who kept to time and provided really informative answers to the questions that have come in. There is a whole lot of rich information in the chat, links to all sorts of resources, which are absolutely fantastic. Uh, and again, um, I hope we can pick up the discussion in session number four, and I look forward to, to seeing you all then. So thank you for your participation so far enjoy your morning and please do come back to us for the fourth and final session i wonder if uh, capuchin from client earth has anything of an administrative nature that she might like to add now before i close uh, no just to say that the second session will be at 12 30 so see you there hopefully so thank you so we will see you all hopefully at 12 30. have a good morning and goodbye for now from ireland Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Edward.